Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday night uh, live stream teaching. Uh, and we are hoping that many of you will join us and uh, participate in our teaching tonight. Good to have as many of you as possible. And those of you who are willing to share uh, this Bible uh, teaching series will be blessed by it. And uh, we're grateful for everyone who joins us. And uh, we are uh, looking forward to digging into the Word of God tonight. We're grateful uh, that today has not brought us tragedy. Today has not brought us depression. Today has not brought us bad news. But today has brought us the goodness of the Lord. And uh, we're going to be praying before we start because we're grateful uh, even though I got a phone call early this morning that Brother Dan Jackson uh, had to be taken to the, the ER, uh, he is doing well tonight. Uh, they have decided to keep him overnight, give him antibiotics, and do some testing on him uh, for a stomach abscess, which uh, the Lord is going to take care of and the doctors are going to take care of. Grateful that we just got news that uh, Ted Bennett is now home from the hospital. We're grateful that situation could have turned out to be very severe, but God is good to his people, and uh, we're grateful for that. Uh, God is good to us whether we acknowledge it or not, but I want to acknowledge the goodness of the Lord and show my thanks uh, to God for his goodness uh, when I could be planning a funeral, I'm rejoicing. And uh, God is so good to each and every one of us. And uh, it's good to gather together and give God thanks. And I'm wondering right now if we could all join together as people are gathering here. If we could join together for prayer. And let's continue praying for Brother Dan Jackson, Ted Bennett. Uh, many others uh, that could use our prayers. Let's continue to pray for our uh, those who are seniors that are having a hard time because they can't come out to the house of God, and uh, it gets lonely at home sometimes, and uh, it's a scary thing. Uh, people see a lot of information on the news, and it's frightening, but let's trust the Lord, and let's pray for those uh, who need some encouragement. Right now, we're going to approach the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you hear us when we pray. We thank you, Lord, that your word says we can ask and receive. And Lord, we ask tonight in the name of Jesus that right in that hospital room where Brother Dan is, that he would feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost touch his body from the head to the toe. And God, we pray that you would touch Ted Bennett, let him continue to get better and come back to the house of the Lord. We pray for many who are facing a uh, serious diagnosis that in Jesus' name, you would turn it around. Those that are fighting a, a battle with cancer, Lord, in Jesus' name, we curse the cancer cells in their body in the name of Jesus and we proclaim health and healing in their body. Lord, we pray tonight that miracles would happen, not by anything that we do, but by your grace and your power. And God, we pray that those that are up in years, that are not able to attend the house of God, and see the, the alarming news on television, Lord, that they would be encouraged by your word. And we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus, and we say, Amen. And we proclaim that the Lord is good. Amen. Well, it's about five minutes after seven, and I've got a lot of ground to cover tonight as we uh, teach our series, Grace 101. And uh, we are endeavoring to uh, teach biblical truth about the subject of grace. Uh, today, as I was preparing for this Bible study. I thought, you know, there are a lot of people that are taught by sincere and loving people, 
But if I taught you sincerely and lovingly that 2 plus 2 is 6, then I would have sincerely and lovingly taught you a lie. I would have misled you in a sincere and loving fashion. And the truth is you cannot have salvation without grace and truth together. And if, you, if your version of grace that you were taught is unbiblical, then you cannot have salvation as the Bible teaches. So this subject is vital to every believer. It's vital that we know uh, what true biblical grace is. Amen. So I'm going to turn your attention tonight to the book of John, chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, reading out of the ESV tonight. Praise God. John chapter 1, verse 16 and 17 says, For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Praise God. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Did you notice that last phrase? Grace and truth. If we were really saying it correctly, we would say grace slash truth because they're always connected, came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth cannot be separated uh, when you describe it. That understanding of grace has got to have truth uh, involved in the definition. Amen. Uh, biblical grace is nothing without the truth of God's word. Amen. Now, the undeserved favor and kindness that we receive from God uh, is great, but it has to acknowledge the truth that comes along with it, and we have to be obedient to the truth uh, in order to receive grace. You say, Pastor, are you preaching that we have to work to receive grace? Absolutely not. But if you don't have truth along with grace, then you have no need for repentance. Uh, if someone did not preach the truth to you that you were lost in your sinful behavior and call you to repentance, then you would not receive grace because truth tells you you're a sinner and you need a savior. Truth tells you that your behavior displeases God. And so in turn, we repent of our sins and then we receive the grace of God that we need in order to change our behavior. If I had to change my behavior on my own, I could not do it. But because of the truth that was given to me, and because I repented of my sins, grace was given to me to be able to change my behavior. Amen. You need God's grace to be able to change your sinful thoughts, behaviors, attitudes, and it's the truth that shows you you need God's grace. Amen. Now, Christ died for us. Aren't you glad that Jesus died for each and every one of us? He didn't just die for religious people. He died for all of us that desire to be in right relationship with God. He died so that we could be saved. Uh, and he died for us while we were still sinning. We were sinners. Uh, Christ died while we uh, did not have grace, and we did not have truth. We were sinners. Uh, and he purchased the opportunity for all men to be saved. Aren't you glad for that? When Jesus died on the cross, I had not yet been born. But I was born into sin, a slave to sin. But he died for me before I would ever be born. And so it gave me the opportunity, praise God, to be saved, and I'm grateful. It was a definitive act of God to send his one and only son 
for, to die on a cross for my sins. That whole process of God sending his son, him dying on Calvary, resurrecting, what do you think that was? It was an act of God's grace. It was his very nature to save us from our sinfulness. Amen. And so, uh, in light of that, grace cannot be received without acknowledgement of God's truth. Now, there are a lot of people that want to come to God based on their version of truth. And they want to believe in God based on uh, their uh, idea of truth, their version of truth. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. But grace cannot be received without acknowledgement, listen to me, of God's truth. And God's truth only comes from God's word. That's where truth is. It doesn't come from Dr. So-and-so, although he may teach the Bible, or uh, this person or that person. God's word is where we get God's truth from. Amen. Now, since we have the Bible and we have the truths that are in it, we have truth which gives us the ability to fully understand. Amen. Now, you wouldn't know you were a sinner had you not received God's truth or God's word. You wouldn't even know that you needed a Savior until somebody preached the word of God or taught you or witnessed to you about God's word in truth and showed you that you are an unredeemed person. You are a sinner. Amen. It's a shame in America that from most pulpits, no one will tell anybody that they are a sinner, that their behavior is wrong in the eyes of God. Not in my eyes, but in the eyes of God. But truth teaches us and causes us to fully understand that we need the grace of God. And then the grace of God, which gives us the power to effectively change. You know, you can have the truth. A lot of people know the Bible, but they're not willing to change. You've got to internalize the truth of God's word and confess with your mouth, I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness and I believe that you came and died for me and I repent of my sinful behavior. That, that's when truth is really uh, doing what it always does. It causes us to have conviction and to believe God's word and uh, then once we have confessed with the mouth and proclaim that Jesus is the Lord of our life, and we have repented of our sins, then God's grace kicks in, and it gives us the ability to be obedient like we should. It gives us the power to live above sin and not live in sin anymore. Amen. Now, why am I saying that? Because hyper-grace or sloppy grace, or whatever form it uh, is taught in, hypergrace is the most current term, is extremely dangerous, okay? Because it all but eliminates the truth factor. It's all mushy, lovey. God will forgive you of anything. God forgives you of your past, present, and future sins. So no matter what you do, God's grace has already covered it. And, and the reason that's dangerous is because it rips the idea out of Christianity of confession of our sins and asking the Lord to forgive us when we sin. Now, I don't want to ask how many of you committed a sin today, but probably in some form or fashion, you didn't do everything that you needed to do out of God's word. Did you pray today? Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Uh, did anything come through your mind as a thought that was ungodly? Uh, we have the privilege of confessing our sins and saying, Lord, forgive me. And the grace of God 
comes and helps us to not do it anymore. Praise God. But hyper grace uh, is all grace and no truth. It's all of God's favor being loaded on my life and in my mind and, and in my personality, but there's no truth involved. You cannot have grace without truth. Amen. It's unbiblical. It's unbiblical. Now, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. You're going down the road, and the speed limit is 45 miles an hour, and you're going 60 miles an hour. And the police officer turns on his lights, and he pulls you over, and uh, he says, do you understand how fast you were going? And you put your head down, and you say, well, yeah, I, I just got in a hurry, and, and, and I'm really sorry. And the officer says to you, he says, you know what, this time I'm going to be gracious and kind, and I'm going to give you a warning to slow down and to obey the speed limit. And you thank the officer, and then you go on your merry way, and then two days later you're going down the same road. You see the sign that says 45 miles an hour, and you think to yourself, well, you know, the officer, he was kind, and and uh, I don't see him anywhere, so you put the pedal to the metal. The next thing you know, you see red and blue flashing lights behind you. The officer gets out of the car, asks for your driver's license and registration. He sees where he gave you grace the last time, but this time he gives you a very uh, costly ticket. Now, you say, well, that's not fair. He gave me grace the first time. Why doesn't he give me grace this time? Because in the warning he gave you the last time was truth. And in the grace he gave you the last time, he was hoping that that grace would teach you to not do what he asked you not to do. So the truth and the grace was in that mercy he showed you the first time. But when you did it again, grace and truth and grace gives you a ticket. The penalty comes up. And so many times, the reason we have a society, a Christian society, that looks like the world and acts like the world and talks like the world is because of this unbiblical teaching of, of hyper grace where well, God just will forgive me, and I, I can't help it. I'm human, and, and I, I'm going to sin a little bit every day. And, uh, but God is trying to teach you through truth and grace to live godly and soberly in this present world. It's because of his grace that we don't disobey the truth that is in the Bible. And God's grace will empower you to not lie and cheat and cuss and steal and do all the things that we know are sinful. Amen. You cannot have all grace and no truth. It does, it's unbiblical. Truth places responsibility on us. The Bible places a responsibility on you to live by the teachings of Jesus Christ. That's why he called us disciples. We learn his truth. We obey his truth. And then he empowers us to live above sin. Amen. Uh, now, truth is not, listen to me, this is important. Truth is not subjective to private interpretations. It's not subjective to your interpretation versus my interpretation. It's not subjective. Uh, there's no Baptist truth versus Pentecostal truth. There's no Catholic truth versus charismatic truth. Truth is truth. The, that's why the Bible says that God's word is forever settled, not down here. Because if it was settled down here, then men could tinker with it and change it. And that's exactly what has happened over the last 50 years, men have tinkered with truth and changed it. But the scripture says God's word, God's truth, is forever settled 
in heaven. Can you say amen? Uh, in turn, all truth with no grace is legalism. I'm going to flip that coin because there are belief systems out there that have all truth. We've got the truth. We have the full truth. We have, we have capitalized on truth. But they don't preach grace and they don't preach love. And they, and, and they only forgive a select few. That's legalism. It's not grace combined with truth. It's all truth and no grace. You can't have it one way or the other. Because the Pharisees hated the idea of grace. Why do you think they killed Jesus? Because they hated the idea of grace. And they sure didn't like his brand of truth. Because it said, love your neighbor as yourself. It said, prefer others above yourself. He called them whited sepulchers with dead men's bones inside. They hated his truth. Because they were outwardly, legalistically, they looked great. But on the inside, they had no grace or any mercy. And so... Uh, truth is truth. And uh, grace and truth is God's design, not my design. Hallelujah. Tr uh, grace and truth is God's design. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, to preach grace and truth to people who have never known condemnation is absolutely fatal. So if you preach grace and truth to people who are not convicted of their sin, there's no condemnation of sin. It's absolutely fatal. Ask yourself the question, when you listen to a lot of modern day Christianity, when's the last time you heard, repent of your sins? When is the last time you heard a preacher say that sin is sin? And this is wrong, and that is wrong. But no, what you hear mostly is, it's okay. God loves you just the way you are. No, God loves you enough to give you the truth and require of you repentance. And repentance is a turning away from sin. It's not continuing to live in your sin. It's a turning away from sin. Well, how do I turn away from sin? I'm addicted. I've always been this way. You repent of your sins and God gives you incredible favor that only he can give through grace. And that grace empowers you to live above sin. Amen. Now, I know some of you are saying that this is cutting in and out, but uh, it will be better when we re-air it. It it's, uh, seems to be okay on my end, so hang in there with me. Amen. Uh, Hypergrace says... Come as you are. Don't change a thing. God's grace lets you remain sinful, but still be saved. You say, Pastor, you're uh, preaching kind of heavy tonight. Well, I've got to preach truth, and I've got to tell you what grace really is. Otherwise, you will believe that God's coming back for a people that's behavior is displeasing to him because grace has already covered it. If grace, uh, forgiveness was past, present, and future, as some teach, then we would have no need to come to church, read the word, pray, repent, try to live right. Uh, there'd be no need of any of that. We could just say the sinner's prayer, boom, we're invested with grace, and just go home and have a turkey sandwich. But it doesn't work that way. God requires of us discipleship where we learn and we get greater grace. Praise God. Notice what Paul said uh, in his approach to the Galatian believers uh, who were being reinstituted. They were trying to reinstitute circumcision into the church, which was... Uh, based on the law. Galatians chapter 16 and verse, or chapter 1, verse 6, Paul said, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting 
him who called you into the grace of Christ. Uh, and you're turning to a different gospel. The Bible says that in the last days there will be doctrines of devils. And one of the doctrines that has come out of hell is the doctrine of hyper grace, where you can live in a fashion that is very unpleasing to God, but you're covered. No, you've got to have truth and grace. Praise God. Now, saving grace can be abandoned for a different type of grace. And that's what a lot of people have done. Uh, I've read books uh, by, by recent authors uh, that, that almost condemn the church as we know it because uh, truth is preached. Uh, there have been uh, also been preachers who have said that they will not preach grace because it just makes everybody, gives everybody a license to sin. No, it doesn't. Grace teaches us to live godly and soberly in this present world. Uh, true believers are called into salvation that only comes by the grace of Christ. Now, Galatians chapter 1 and verse 8, Paul drives it in even further. And he says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one that we preach to you, let him be accursed. Now, if somebody comes down the road that can say it better than me and, and uh, promise you great things and they can uh, teach you a doctrine of grace that requires no truth, no repentance, no living a godly life, no inner holiness that, that cleans up your language and cleans up your thought life and, and your character, you'd better run from that person because they're teaching you something that Paul said, let him or her be accursed. Uh, isn't it interesting that even the subject of giving is attached to this thing we call grace? 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. Uh, and listen to what the scripture says. The point is this, Paul was telling the Corinthians, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. That's truth. That's a, that's a law. That's truth. And then verse 7, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's a grace element there. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. What was just taught there? The truth is, what you sow, you'll reap. If you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. If you sow generously, you'll reap generously. But then uh, God shows us the grace that he has. He doesn't compel you to give. He doesn't uh, slam his fist on uh, the podium of heaven and say, bless God, if you don't tithe, you're going to hell. Uh, you, that's not even biblical, but some people preach it. That is truth, uh, their version of truth without the grace of God, because the scripture says, don't give out of compulsion, don't give out of uh, being forced to give, but if you give out of a good, grace-filled heart, from the cheerfulness of your uh, heart, then God will bless and multiply grace to you. Aren't you glad that grace is abundant and free if we obey God's word? Amen. Now, I've got about five minutes here, and uh, we'll be ending for tonight and picking up next week. Uh, grace is shown to us throughout the scriptures. God's grace is shown to us primarily in the New Testament, but even God's grace was present in the Old Testament when they were even under the law. They, they did what God asked, and God blessed their crops. He gave them houses that they didn't build. He gave them uh, things that, that they always had desired. God gave them uh, the land that flowed with milk and honey. That was God's grace because they responded to the law. Uh, 
Do we live under the law? Absolutely not. But we do live under the truth, uh, the law of Christ. Jesus gave a law. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. When you obey that law, the law of Christ, grace is given to you. Praise God. Uh, now, uh, let me talk just a little bit more about this hypergrace subject or sloppy grace. There's a popular quote that I've read many times that says, grace is having a relationship with someone's heart, not their behaviors. You know what? That sounds awful nice. Uh, it sounds awful nice until you're the son or daughter of a uh, person who is addicted to alcohol and calls themselves a Christian. A person who goes to church on Sunday, puts money in the plate, acts like a Christian, comes home and gets drunk, and beats the wife and mistreats the kids. Uh, you say, well, Daddy had a, uh, a good heart. He really did have a good heart. Uh, that's the, the faulty thinking of hyper grace. Grace is having a relationship with someone's heart and not their behaviors. You can't have it both ways and be true biblical grace. Uh, you can't deny the call of John the Baptist, Jesus, and all the apostles throughout the New Testament. The call, what did Jesus come preaching? Repentance. What did John preach? Repentance. What did Peter preach on the day of Pentecost? Repent and be baptized, every one of you. What did Paul preach? Repent and give your life totally, completely to the teachings of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hyper grace says this, God forgives all sins and all sins are forgiven, so there is no need to confess or turn from your sin. Hyper grace is a fallacy. And it's not that I'm trying to be better than somebody who preaches or, or who preaches or teaches hyper grace. I'm not superior to anybody, but God's word is superior to all of us. And we are taught to live uh, by God's grace. Listen to Jude chapter 1, verse 4 in the ESV. Jude chapter 1, verse 4. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people, amen, ungodly people who pervert, listen, the grace of God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. That is exactly why you're seeing what you see today. And ashamedly, you see this in uh, churches just as well as you do in the world. I hear it on a regular basis. Matter of fact, I just heard it today of a man who uh, years ago was a preacher, pastor, and uh, while the offering was being taken, he slipped out the back door of the church, got in the car with a nurse from the local hospital, and abandoned his wife and his church and just left. Now, you might say, Pastor, God's grace covers that. And you know what? God's grace can cover that when that person repents of their sins and falls on their face before God, admits that they have sinned, goes to the people they have harmed and hurt and makes it right, and then the grace of God can be restored to that person. Amen. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4. Revelation is the book you read to receive blessing. Revelation uh, says, consider how far you have fallen. He was, uh, Jesus was talking to one of the early churches, and he said to that entire church, consider how far you have fallen. You can have stained glass in the windows, a steeple on top of the building, 
and be a church that has fallen so far from biblical truth and biblical grace that you don't even realize how far you've fallen from God. Uh, consider, look at it, how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at the first. You see, we've got to sometimes look at where we used to be when we first got saved and how much we loved God, loved his word, couldn't wait to get to church, couldn't wait to sing. We didn't care what was being sung. We didn't go to church to have a fashion show. We went to church to have church, fall in love with Jesus, obey his word, rally around God's truth, and then God's grace was poured out upon us. Amen. Grace gives us time to repent but does not allow us to live an unrepentant life from sins we fall into. I know as Christians we stumble and we fall. Sometimes we say things out of anger. Sometimes we get depressed and, and we have unbelief in our heart. Sometimes we uh, struggle with family relationships and uh, we must understand that God calls us to a life of repentance and therefore we receive God's grace and mercy which brings us back into right relationship with God. Amen. Uh, God will not allow you to stay in the sin that got you in the place you were in. Now, do Christians sin? Yes, they do. They do. Do preachers sin? Yes, they do. Uh, sometimes preachers are worse gossips than uh, the whole ladies auxiliary is. I'm going to get in trouble for that, but it's okay. I'm telling you the truth. Uh, do they all need to repent? Absolutely. And change. Recover. Amen. Hyper grace teaches uh, a lot of strange things. Now, Mark chapter 12, verse 31, I'm wrapping up. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. This does not exclude the Ten Commandments from the Old Testament. I've heard people say, well, the Ten Commandments don't matter anymore. They're not relevant to our day and time. Oh, yes, they are. They're absolutely relevant. Thou shalt not kill is still relevant to today. Thou shalt not bear false witness is still relevant to today. Amen. And all the rest of the Ten Commandments. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. And so we need the truth of God's word. Uh, anytime you begin to hear uh, sermon titles like, uh, I heard a sermon title uh, from a church called The Reckless, Relentless, Sloppy Grace of God. I about fell out of my chair when I read it. The Reckless, Relentless, Sloppy Grace of God. That's not biblical grace. Uh, the, the church, that church didn't have Jesus in mind. Uh, song lyrics that describe grace as God's reckless, never-ending, always loving requires nothing to maintain grace. We need to be careful of those lyrics. Um, there's a, a song called One Thing That Remains by Jesus Culture. Your love never fails. The song never mentions Jesus by name. Uh, it's almost like Jesus is my girlfriend. Uh, and the feeling evades the through the whole idea of the song. Uh, Lev never fails. It never gives up. Uh, never runs out. Listen, God's grace is amazing. Uh, there's no denying that. God's grace is free to all. But truth has to come with grace. Uh, a few years ago, there was a song that uh, talked about Grace being like a sloppy, wet kiss. Listen, folks, that is nothing more than tinkering with God's word. Amen. 
grace that does not teach you anything. Uh, no pursuit of godliness, no pursuit of holiness, uh, no sobriety or self-control, uh, or to be of a sound, sensible mind. It sexualizes the description of God. Run from that. Anything that makes God sound like he's your boyfriend, run from that. It's not true biblical grace. This grossly distorts biblical definition of God's truth and grace. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about Romans 11 and verse 6. I hope you've enjoyed tonight. I pray that you will take this into your heart and uh, share it with those who need to hear it. You say, well, I don't need to hear it. I think we all need to hear it. I think we all need to examine our view of God's grace as the Bible says it is. Grace is amazing. Grace is wonderful. I'm so glad that God's grace is in my life, but I'm also glad that God's truth is above all other truths. Amen. Let's pray before we're dismissed tonight. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for everyone watching and everyone who will watch. We ask you, Lord, that you give us the grace and mercy to rightly divide the word of truth. Help us, Lord, to stand for truth when others mock the truth. Help us, Lord, to believe that your grace is the only thing that can save us. But, Lord, help us to live and trust your word. And we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, and we pray God's blessings on each and every one of you. God bless you. Have a wonderful week in the Lord. We will see you at Life Church on Sunday at 11 a.m. If you can't be there in person, join us on Facebook, and we pray God's blessings on you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.